Praise the Lord. People of God, welcome back to the Biblos Network. We're so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. I trust God is helping you and sustaining you where you are. You're making it through this crazy world and this crazy society that we find ourselves in. <laughs> I was talking to an elder the other day and they were saying, I, I never thought I would see this day. I never thought I would see the day when political tensions were so high and when the moral scheme and the moral landscape of the United States of America was so radically shifting. But it has been said before that when David was recording the Psalms and he made the statement that the mountains would flee, they, they would melt, that the sea would flee before God. And uh, he, he talked about the radical landscape shifting when the Lord appeared. That is prophetic eschatological language and it's poetic. But some have posited that it was a nod towards David's landscape shifting radically, going from Saul being a trusted leader, honoring his brethren, looking up to them, watching his father's sheep, to running for his life, to fighting Goliath, and finally in the, in the wilderness, running for his life for many, many years, and, and, then, and then to become the king, to become the king of Israel, to become a mighty man of war, that life's landscapes shift, and they shift dramatically, and the one constant through it all is that God is the king, and he sustains us, and he keeps us. And so that is what it's all about. That is what the scripture teaches. We have held to that for many, many years, and our family has held to that. Our churches have held to that. I know that you are holding to that, and God is a great redeemer and a savior. So it's a great day to be apostolic, a great day to be living for God. I have some wonderful things uh, to share with you today, but before I do that, take a moment and go over to the Biblos merchandise. Check it out. Uh, we have orders coming in all the time. We're sending out sweatshirts and hoodies and, and clothing and hats and mugs and, and every purchase goes to support the mission here at Biblos. And, and I pray we are a blessing to you. I pray that we are helping you to fall more deeply in love with the things of God. Um, all right. I want to read a portion of scripture today in the book of Luke chapter 22 or 23 rather. This is Jesus. Um, the multitude has gathered around Jesus. They have led him to Pilate. They are accusing him. They're trying to box Pilate in between a rock and a hard place that if he allows Jesus to go, then he is not a friend of Caesar's. And so finally, you know, Pilate is trying to strike a compromise here and do what's right. There's no fault in Jesus. He's, there's no reason to kill him, but, but the Jews are adamant. And so here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 11, the Bible says this, Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity between themselves. There's this thing that happens in life. And if you have been serving God for any length of time, you will find this to be true. You will find yourself in this predicament at one point or another. And that is when you're trying to do right, you're trying to do good, you're going to run into people who the truth is not their main priority. They're, they're finding out what is accurate, what, what we are to be accountable to, what is, what is right in a certain situation, even when it is detrimental to their own goals, that people will betray the truth. And here, Jesus being betrayed is the essence of the truth being betrayed. betrayed. Literally, Jesus is the truth. <laughs> He's the way, the truth, the life, and they are betraying him. They are rejecting him. And literally, truth stands chained before the council, before the kangaroo court. 
Herod wants a show. Pilate just wants out of this predicament. He's trying to keep the peace. This is a local uprising. He feels that it's some obscure thing and he thought it would be an easy fix and then come to find out Jesus is completely innocent. And he's about to condemn an innocent man. And there's this thing that happens in life where when you stand for truth, people oftentimes, it's, it's an unpopular thing. They can dislike you. They can be angered by a refusal to go along, to get along. Um, and we have a saying, it's been in our family for many years, that when, when people band together to combat the truth and to combat what is right, that they will make alliances against you for expedience sake, expediency. And we've, we, what we'll say when that happens is we'll just look at one another and we'll say, it's Pilate and Herod. It's Pilate and Herod. There is a uniting of people who are not of the truth. And when you fight for the truth in, in your life, in your daily activities, you'll, you'll find this to be true of coworkers. You'll find it to be true of family. You'll find it to be true even in the church. There'll be people who find common ground. This is often very, very true of backsliders. Um, people who leave God, they leave the principles of the word of God, will unite oftentimes against the apostolic church because they have common ground. They, they have a common enemy and the common enemy is Jesus. So they might have been at, their, at each other's throats prior to this. They might have been the most bitter of enemies. They might have been angry with each other every day. Nothing good to say about one another. Oftentimes they will slander one another. Um, but when they encounter a common enemy that stands up for what is right, oftentimes they close ranks. I know you have seen this. Maybe I can help shed some light on how to combat it and how to keep on keeping on. Because the forces of this world will close ranks. This is true of false doctrine. There are people in denominational churches that are bitter enemies, but when an apostolic says that I don't believe the Trinity, whew, they'll close ranks. And I mean, all of a sudden they are lockstep together and all of their doctrinal differences are forgotten. All of their battles that they had just the day before are forgotten. Now they have a common, a common enemy and they will attack you. And that's true of relationships, it's true of denominations, it's true of so many circumstances in life. And the thing, the thing that we as children of God have to contend for is we want to be of the truth. We want to contend for what is right. And when I say contend, the Bible actually uses the phrase earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So we contend for the Acts 238 message the John 3, 5 message, the Deuteronomy 6 mandate. We contend for holiness. We contend for every good thing that God has given to us in this New Testament era, this epoch of time. Pilate and Herod, they come together. They unite. They hated one another. I, I had a situation. I had, this has happened to me multiple times, but not too long ago. I had two men that were at each other's throats, uh, Figuratively, they could not get along. They did not uh, speak well of one another. They had nothing good to say. They, they were very abrupt with one another. I tried to keep peace between them. One of them was very antagonistic of the other. He told me he, he, he needs to be sat down, Pastor Urshan. He needs to be sat down. He's out of order. He's disrespectful. He's carnal. He's this, he's that. He doesn't pray enough. <laughs> I have found oftentimes that the people who prattle on about everybody else oftentimes are the ones with the biggest problems. Well, that, that guy that was telling me that he got offended over something and he left the church. He left the church and he, he made a lot of noise when he left the church and it saddened me. It saddened me as, as a leader, as a pastor, broke my heart. I don't ever want to see anybody leave God and it happens and it happened there. And shortly after that, this other person did the same thing. Well, when that happened, they were both angry at the church. And um, 
oftentimes, almost all the time, it's because of a lack of prayer. It, people grow carnal. They grow um, very natural thinking. They become very critical. They, they, they start looking for fault instead of uh, looking for things to rejoice over. You will always find fault. <laughs> if you have humans, you are going to have fault. You will have hypocrites. You will have things that you can point out. That is true everywhere. It's true in mechanic shops. It's true in barber shops. It's true in grocery stores. And it's true in churches. There will always be issues with people. But they left. And when they left, they connected outside the church and they became the best of friends. And they, they do what so many people do. They went on social media and they began to uh, throw their... Um, they're stones. They're digital stones. They had a lot of things to say, and it was unpleasant. What do you do in a situation like that when you got a little social media banter going on, and there's a lot of innuendo and a, a lot of things uh, that are said? Uh, my friend, Brother Ari Prado, used to say, he said, when I do that, I just block them. I block them on the Internet. I block them on Instagram. I block them on Facebook. And he said, welcome to the block party. <laughs> Uh, well, what is true is you don't have to subject yourself to it. Um, I think this will help people, and I have found this to be true in my life. Maybe it will help you. Time proves all things. Time proves all things. The truth will be made manifest, and time is the friend of the righteous, and it is the enemy of the hypocrite. It is the enemy of the rash. It is the adversary of the carnal. And so as people of God, we enter into God's rest. We rest from our labors. We cease from our battles. The, the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. Um, so love people. Even when they're saying things that are, are contrary, they're saying things that are hurtful, love them. Don't, don't wish ill upon them. Jesus, his, his, the way Jesus dealt with Pilate and Herod is how we are to deal with people today. Jesus said, forgive them, Lord. And it wasn't a pious show of trying to look magnanimous and trying to look holy, holier than thou. You know, it was, it was a prayer to the Father. Please forgive them, for they know not what they do. They aren't aware that they're driven by spirits and by devils that are pushing the levers, pushing the buttons, pulling the levers. I want to be led by the Holy Ghost. I want, I want to fight the Lord's battles. And so what do we do when we come across people who betray the truth, who have bias, who, who have ulterior motives, who really want to live in the world, but say they don't. They have carnal reasoning. They create contention. They sow discord. They are whisperers. They are murmurers. That's probably the biggest, biggest battle in churches and it is, has been that way since Israel. Moses' biggest adversaries were not the tribes around them. It was the murmurers and the complainers that were among, among the people. So what do we do? Well, Jesus, the Bible says that he did not answer them. He spoke with Pilate to some degree because with Pilate there was a modicum of truth in Pilate. Pilate even asked the question, what is truth? powerful iconic statement when truth stands before you personified in the man Christ Jesus truth was chained before him and I'll just throw this in here as another thing and this will this will preach for the preachers that listen to this um, you have to unshackle truth if you want to be free the truth is going to go where it wants to and it's going to reveal what it wants to and it's going to do the work of heaven but if you will buy the truth and sell it not your Bible says the truth will make you free it will make you free. And in order to make you free, you have to free the truth. So free the Acts 238 message. Free the one God message. Free the message of holiness. And let truth do its redemptive work. Let Jesus do his redemptive work. So why? Why does it happen? Why do people fight against what is true? Why do they contend for their own views? You know, you can just become competitive. It can become personal. And I, I say this of myself, particularly when I was younger, I can remember getting into arguments or debates with people and it became more about winning than it did the truth. You know, I would rather, I would rather lose a battle and be honest to the truth. What one, one prophet said, valiant 
for the truth. I would rather do that than to continue to fight to prove I'm right, to present my points and to think I'm superior. I think that we have to handle the truth with humility and with grace. Yeah. There's a, there's a portion of scripture in, in the book of Revelation where John sees Jesus as the lamb and he has seven eyes and he has seven horns and it was, he was as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And, and there he was, he's on the throne, he's slain and his blood is redeeming and he has seven eyes, which means he has whole vision. He is completely whole in his vision or, or perfect in vision. And he has seven horns, perfect in power. So he has the perfect balance of vision and power. That's Jesus. And I, I want to, I want to be a steward of vision and I want to be a steward of power. The power God has given to me, the vision God has given to me. I want to see accurately. I want to see truth. And that starts with looking at myself. It starts with removing the beam that's in my eye. <laughs> So in the book of John chapter eight, Jesus is in, in this, this battle and he is dealing with the Pharisees, the scribes, the Pharisees, the, the woman has been caught in adultery. Jesus, um, he forgives her. He, he condemns them for their judgmental behavior and, and spirit. And then begins this back and forth, this very toxic back and forth where they mock him. They, they really ridicule Jesus. So the woman goes her way. Jesus says, I don't condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus says to them, I am the light of the world. So just out of the gate, he says, without me, you can't see. I'm the light. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That right there is the crux of the matter. You cannot see if you don't have light. So if you're not praying, if you're not full of the Holy Ghost, if you're not faithful to church and, and that constant renewal of the Holy Ghost, and I know denominational people will get very angry at that statement. They don't think you need to go to church or a lot of people today feel like you don't need to go to the church. I'm telling you church, going to church is one of the greatest things you can do. Go to church, support your pastor, worship God, get into the spirit because that corporate worship is irreplaceable. Get to the house of God and let God renew you and refill you because there's a darkness. There's a darkness that comes upon a people. I've watched it happen. I've watched people that one day they will be so, they'll see things so clearly. And, and a week later, without prayer and without a touch from God, their, their, their perspective is so skewed and so radically warped, distorted. I'm the light of the world. The Pharisee said to him, you bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. He says, I, did, I do bear record of myself. My record is true. You judge after the flesh, I judge no man. So there's this banter, this back and forth. He's trying to communicate with them and they are attacking him. Um, if I judge, my judgment is true for I'm not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Trinitarians will take that and say, look, see, there's two people. There's obviously two people, but you know, <laughs> that is the man Christ Jesus. That is the invisible spirit of God, the true human and the spirit of God working in tandem together. There's no problem with oneness theology there. Um, it's written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear, bear witness of myself. The father that sent me beareth witness of me. So there was a separation of Jesus humanity and, or I should say a distinction between Jesus humanity and his divinity. He had a real human mind and he also had the divine spirit of the father living inside of him. So there, these are the two witnesses. This is a human witness. This is a divine witness. Uh, Jesus says, you don't know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. So they're back and forth, back and forth. And what's being said here is I am in light. You are in darkness. I am from above. You are from beneath. And he goes on to say things like he that sent me is the father. He has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. And then he gets into later on down the chapter, verse 32, verse 33, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. They said, we are Abraham's seed. And Jesus goes on to say, you are of your father, the devil. 
So that is a powerful statement. He is literally calling them children of Satan. And all sinners are children of Satan. You can't sugarcoat it. You have to look it right in the eyes. You have to come to grips with the fact that it, it is enmity against God. It is adversarial to God. And Pilate and Herod had that in common. They were of this world. The wisdom of this world is, is evil. It is sensual. It is devilish. It is carnal. And the wisdom that is from above is peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. And Jesus is saying one thing and he's looking at him saying, why can't you hear my words? Because you are not from above. You are from beneath. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. There is a battle against truth. And sometimes it's not what you're saying. It's the spirit that you are of. There are people that won't like you and they don't even know you. They just hate the spirit that you are of. Truth does that. It is polarizing. Jesus, they were so repelled by his truth and by his righteousness that the commonality that they had, the enmity that they had together evaporated and they came together as a common enemy against the truth. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, the lusts of your father, you will do. So people are driven. They're driven by their lusts. They're driven by what they want they, And if you stand in the way of that, by telling people the truth, this is why Herod killed John the Baptist. John wanted what he wanted. He wanted to marry Herodias. John withstood that heaven's emissary, heaven's messenger stood and told that man the truth. And he was hated because of it. That's what will happen when you tell people the truth. Not everybody's happy to hear this truth. God's sheep hear his voice. They will repent, but there are many people that will be angered at what you say. Verse 45, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So there's this above, beneath, darkness, light dynamic. They cannot hear you. They cannot see because they walk in darkness. This is a thing I've seen play out over and over and over in my life. And I want to get into how we combat that. But before I do, I want to tell you about something very special. October the 17th to the 24th of this year, 2024, there is a great, great event that's taking place. It's called the seven churches of Asia and the Ephesus event. So there's a great group of people that are headed up by Dr. Johnny King and Wilson university, and they are going to Istanbul, Turkey, and they are going to see the churches of Asia, the churches of the book of Revelation. I have been on this trip before. It is one of the most amazing, amazing trips. Smyrna, Thyatira. I have been to Ephesus. Um, we will have exclusive, I will be on this trip. We will have exclusive access to the Ephesus archeological site after closing hours when the ruins are lighted. We will have a service there. And if you want to know more about this, you can go to Premier Bible Land Journeys at BibleLand.ca, BibleLand.ca. It's going to be an amazing, amazing trip. Uh, the cost of it is $2,500 for the land package. And there's going to be speakers there, Brother Doug Walker, myself, Bishop Wilson, uh, the Miles Young, Brother Caleb Adams. I will be there. Uh, uh, Dr. Johnny King, BibleLand.ca. Seven Churches of Asia tour. You don't want to miss that. It is going to be great. I hope I will see you there. All right. How do we combat people that have no desire for truth? They have no desire for the purpose of God. They think they do. These Pharisees were saying, we are of God. We are of God, not you. And here is God <laughs> in flesh talking to them. And all they want to do is kill him. One of the things Jesus did was he would not answer them, particularly Herod. He did not answer Herod, and he spoke little to Pilate. He answered them not a word. One place in the scripture says that he, he is the blind servant. I've done a session on the blind servant before. But it means to be blind to things that don't matter, to be deaf to things that don't matter. If they are not of eternal import, if they are mocking, if they are insulting, if they are trying to get a rise out of you with sharply worded things. I had a young man one time who, um, he was always contentious. He always wanted to argue about the things of God and, 
he told me I didn't know what I was talking about. I, it was very contentious, very toxic. And, um, later on I found out from somebody else that they had gotten an argument with him and he cussed them out. I mean, he used every word, words that would make a sailor blush with shame. And in front of God and country, he just cussed a blue streak. And I, it struck me how the, the, ego of people, the arrogance of people that they can have all of that anger and vitriol and hatred on the inside and yet will come to preachers and, and to men and women of God who have given their life for this and will contend with them and argue with them and, and really be antagonistic and adversarial. Facebook warriors, Instagram warriors. <laughs> um, God bless their heart. What are you going to do? Well, first of all, you don't talk. You don't engage with that. These are not the weapons of our warfare. Sarcasm is not our weapon. Anger and volume and sharply worded retorts, Instagram battles, uh, Facebook battles, uh, throwing inflammatory remarks at one another, even the tone of voice that you use, these are not, these are not our weapons. And God's not pl happy with us when we engage in that. So the first thing Jesus did was he wouldn't speak. It, it angered Herod that he wouldn't speak. And Pilate marveled that he wouldn't speak. Don't you know that I have the power to, to condemn you or to set you free? And boy, that got to rise out of Jesus. He, he, he looked at Pilate and said, you have no power unless it was given to you from on high. But this is your hour. This is the power of darkness. And he, he yielded himself. He became obedient to death. It feels like you're winning when you respond in kind, when you fight fire with fire, when you fight sarcasm with sarcasm. I, I, I'm telling you here today, it does no good, no good at all. It's, it, it'll cause your blood pressure to rise and, and it will actually hurt a person when you engage in those kind of battles. The Bible says of us that we are to fight the Lord's battles. So I want to tell you about one of those battles and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to a close here. Ahab is a perfect example of someone who is out of alignment with God and, and his neighboring king, Jehoshaphat. Ahab is the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. They are not the same. Ahab has, is surrounded by false prophets, people that tell him what he wants to hear. And you'll find that people that are not of the truth will surround themselves by people that give them the same narrative. You can get a big crowd of people that'll tell you what you want to hear, particularly if you are the common enemy. <laughs> Jesus was the common enemy. And in the Old Testament, the prophet was the common enemy, Micaiah. Many false prophets are there and they are telling Ahab what he wants to hear. And people who are not of the truth seek out people to tell them what they want to hear. People who believe false doctrines seek out false prophets People who want to win their argument, they don't necessarily want the truth, will seek out people that will validate them. I think they call that confirmation bias. And Ahab did that. So he's surrounded by false prophets. Jehoshaphat, however, is from above. He did hear from God. He was a righteous king, and he knows a yes man, a yes man when he sees them. And these are all yes men. And he says, don't you have anybody here that speaks the truth? Well, the answer was no. <laughs> Ahab didn't want the truth. He didn't want to know what was right. He wanted what he wanted. He was not of the truth. He walked in darkness and his wife, oftentimes behind a weak Ahab, there will be an aggressive Jezebel. His wife is busy seducing and murdering behind the scenes. He says, yes, there's one. His name's Micaiah, but I hate him because he never prophesies good things about me. So they bring Micaiah in. And that's another thing. People that are in the wrong and do not contend for the truth, do not care about truth. They care for what they want, what they desire, the lusts of your father, Jesus said you will do. They'll be upset because you don't tell them what they want to hear. And so that's what I, how Ahab felt and he brings Micaiah in. Micaiah speaks truth and one of the false prophets walks over to him, him and slaps him. Who do you think you are? And there's one place that's running from me. It might be here. It might be another place. It's running from me just right now. But one of them 
ran up to one of the God's messengers and slapped him and said, which way went the spirit of God from me to thee? <laughs> and there's this contention and there's this immense pressure that's on men of God that face multitudes that are, that are not right with God. Micaiah tells the truth. He tells them that Ahab's going to die. So Ahab hears this. And when you're of error, when you are of the spirit of error versus the spirit of truth, you get involved in the machinations, the manipulations, the politicization of things. Politics is filled with this. Church politics, natural politics, Washington, D.C. politics. Politics has no place in the church. No place. And Ahab figures, I'm going to play politics. He dresses up like a foot soldier. He puts on raiment, clothing that he thinks will hide him. A lot of people are very good at hiding what they really are. When they're one thing in secret and they're one thing out in the open. And Ahab does that and we see Jehoshaphat fighting in the battle that following day and Ahab fights in that battle the following day. And the opposing army, the uh, Syrian army, they said, do not fight with any of the soldiers. Go straight for the king. We're going to take out the king. Well, nobody knew who the king was and they first thought Jehoshaphat was the king and when they figured out that wasn't him, they, they turned their attention to find where Ahab was so nobody can find him. And the Bible says that one drew back his bow and shot an arrow and it struck Ahab. You cannot escape the judgment of God. The word of God will come true. The truth will be made manifest. It's going to happen. It is the friend of the righteous. It is the enemy of the hypocrite. That arrow found its mark and God's word will find its mark. Ahab died. And the dogs licked his blood, the Bible says. Here's what's interesting about that. And some people don't connect this, but I find it intriguing. The rabbis say that they believe that Naaman the leper was the man that killed Ahab. When you read the scripture and you read about Naaman and you read about Ahab, you find that the scripture has something very, very interesting to say about Naaman. Naaman, you know, he's a leper. He, he's, he, this is the Naaman that dips seven times in the Jordan River. And he is a Syrian uh, captain of the host. I'm trying to find it here while I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, so we, we get to the story of Elijah and Elisha. And, you know, we, we read Naaman in the context of Elisha because Elisha is the one that met him and told him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River. But if we, you get to 2 Kings chapter 5, and Naaman is a captain of the host, a great king of Syria. He was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. By him. Some translations render that by his hand. And so when the scripture says that one drew back his bow, the rabbis believe that that points to Naaman, which is interesting because that means Naaman is fighting the Lord's battle when, when the Jews won't, the Gentiles do. And it's interesting further that Naaman is the only one Jesus references when it talks about the lepers. There were many lepers in Israel at the time of Naaman the leper, but unto none of them was the prophet sent but to Naaman. Naaman just stayed busy about the battles of God. And even though he's an opposing force, he's, he's not in Israel, yet God used him to kill Ahab, if this narrative is true. Wouldn't that be something? We do know he took a young slave, a young lady. She gave him the word that there's a prophet that can heal you in Israel if you will only go. And Naaman makes the trek over there. He dips seven times in the muddy waters, which is a is a powerful metaphor for of completion. Seven is completion. He comes up. That's the new birth. That's baptism in Jesus name being foreshadowed. Praise God. And, and Naaman becomes a 
a forerunner and a foreshadowing of the Gentiles that if Ahab's not going to do it and Jezebel's not going to do it, God will raise up somebody that will do it. And heaven will have people that hears God's voice. Naaman allowed himself to be used of God and he goes down in the scripture as one of the heroes of faith as he deals with Elisha. Whether it's true or not that he was the one that drew back the bow, we'll have to ask God when we get to heaven. But I like it and I'm determined that I'm not going to answer evil and I'm going to fight God's battles. The truth will emerge. Pilate and Herod will not win. The Bible says, though hand join in hand, the wicked will not be unpunished. And then, you know, it's not right to wish evil on anybody. So my hope for enemies and for adversaries, I hope they repent. I hope they get right with God. I want them to go to heaven. I want them to, to see Jesus. And so we bless them. This is how we fight our battles. We do not answer railing for railing, evil for evil, but we pray for them that despitefully use us and say all manner of evil falsely against us for the sake of, of God. And we get busy doing what's right. So when they, when they talk bad about you, go teach a Bible study. When they say something negative and they want to spread it around through everybody, go and win somebody to God. Baptize somebody in Jesus' name. Tell somebody about this great gospel and watch what God does in your life. So this is Pilate and Herod. This is fighting the Lord's battles. I hope that helps you today uh, where you are. Do good. Help people. Bless people. Don't fall into the trap of the tit for tat. He said, she said, going back and forth. But be a son of God. Be a daughter of God. Be blind to the insults. Be deaf to the mockery. And keep your eyes firmly fixed on heaven. Until next time, God bless you. God keep you. And God cause his face to shine upon you.